Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our Wisconsin's Green Fire Conservation Webinar, Voyage to the Bottom of the World. This is the second in our April Conservation Webinar Series. My name is Fred Clark, and I'm the Executive Director of Wisconsin's Green Fire, and I'm joined today by our Assistant Director, Nancy Larson, and two of our active, longstanding Green Fire members, Robert Raleigh and Karen Messmer of Baraboo. And we're excited in just a few minutes to join Robert and Karen on the voyage that they took to Antarctica and, and other points south uh, from which they just returned one month ago. For those of you who are Green Fire members, we're glad to provide the opportunity to have our members share their experiences with you. So welcome and thank you for joining us. And for those of you who are joining us for the first time, uh, we appreciate your interest and we hope that you find this program valuable. Wisconsin's Green Fire is a Wisconsin-based organization that supports the conservation legacy of our state by promoting science-based management of natural resources. We collectively are one of Wisconsin's strongest voices for conservation and for the role of science. Our members work throughout Wisconsin on issues ranging from wildlife, fisheries, water resources, forests, farming and conservation, the science of climate change and how we respond to it and, and our path to a renewable energy and a sustainable future. We encourage you to learn more about Green Fire on our website or to follow us on social media. Now for a few uh, points on uh, the technical side of using Zoom webinar. Uh, I think many of us are learning new technology uh, rapidly in the last month. Um, as attendees in the webinar, you will, should be able to see us and hear us, but we will not be able to see you or to hear you. Uh, however, we can have back and forth communication. So many of you will see uh, view options control in the upper right side of your screen. And if you do, uh, that should give you some options for how you want to display our images and the, the photos that Robert and Karen will be sharing. Um, also, if you're having technical issues, I just want to call your attention to uh, the lower part of the screen here. And you should see uh, a toolbar that will look something like this. And the chat box allows you to send a text message uh, to us as hosts and our panelists. And we encourage you to use the chat box uh, if you're having a technical problem, if the volume's not loud enough, or um, uh, if there's something you think one of us ought to know as hosts, uh, you can tip us off and uh, we'll try to address it. Uh, we also want to encourage people to ask questions. So when Robert and Karen are completed with their uh, presentation and uh, showing us uh, a subset of the 8,000 slides that uh, they took together, uh, we'll have a question and answer period. Uh, in order to submit a question, just click on the Q&A box and that will allow you to submit a question. And Nancy will uh, field those and we'll try to get to many of them as possible after the presentation. Uh, finally, for those of you who are seeing a wave hand um, option on the bottom of your screen, uh, select that option if you wanna get a cold beer. And we won't be able to provide you the beer, but we do want to know how many people are interested in drinking beer during our program. So that will be very helpful information for us. Uh, so before we introduce Robert and Karen, Nancy, anything else uh, you want to add? No, I think that covers it, Fred. Again, please use the Q&A function and we'd like to have this as interactive as we can. So we'd like to hear your comments and questions. All right, thank you. Uh, so our hosts today are two people, uh, longtime Wisconsin residents, former neighbors of mine in Baraboo, and two people have de dedicated their careers to conservation. Uh, Robert Raleigh is a wildlife biologist, recently retired after 34 years, most of which was with the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources. 
And uh, for any of us who have enjoyed deer hunting uh, or wildlife and our outdoor pursuits in Wisconsin, Robert is one of the people we can thank for having one of the nation's best uh, and most respected wildlife management programs. In his retirement, Robert's devoting more time to photography, paddling, birding, and traveling. Uh, Karen Mesmer is a career science educator and as a teacher for 33 years, Karen has inspired middle school kids to love science, both in teaching in Northwest Alaska, as well as in Baraboo, Wisconsin. Uh, Karen now works independently as a consultant with teachers and school districts uh, throughout the country and more recently throughout the world. And in fact, she has worked with more than 50 different school districts as a science consultant and has also traveled and worked in 20 different countries. Uh, together, Robert and Karen uh, spend uh, their summers or a good part of their summers on Lake Superior, which they've done for 20 years, kayaking extensively on the big lake. And many of you have seen their presentations um, at Canoe Copia um, about those travels. But today we are going to hear about a very different travel, um, the voyage that they just took uh, and returned from to Antarctica. So with that, Robert and Karen, we will turn it over to you. And thank you for being here. So we can get our screen to share and... So this is a trip we took uh, in February and uh, early March uh, before the, uh, the world shut down. Um, it was a 19 day trip uh, starting in the southern tip of South America, going up to the Falkland Islands, over to South Georgia Island, and down to the Antarctic Peninsula and then back across the Drake Passage, to, uh, back to Ushuaia. The uh, trip was with Cork Expeditions, who have been running uh, polar expeditions um, for nearly 30 years. And we were on board the Ocean Adventurer, which is a relatively small expedition ship, um, about 100 meters long, and accommodates about 120 uh, guests. We picked this particular trip uh, because it included a kayaking option. And as hardcore kayakers, I don't think I could have gotten Karen to, to go without, um, without that option. Kayaking was a plus. So to, to get there, um, we flew out of Chicago uh, down to Houston and changed planes and did an overnight flight from Houston to Buenos Aires. I uh, spent the day in Buenos Aires and um, recovered from the overnight flight. Then the next day we flew another three hour flight down to Ushuaia. And Ushuaia claims to be the southernmost city in the world. Um, has a population of about 56,000 in the uh, 2010 census, but it's been expanding rapidly since then. It's a neat little town, sort of uh, sandwiched in between the Andes Mountains and the Eagle Channel. Uh, we had a couple days in Ushuaia to uh, rest up from all of our travels, um, you know, before getting on the ship. We spent a lot of it along the coastline looking for birds, um, seeing what we could add to our life list. Uh, before getting onto the ship, they um, did a health screening, took all of our temperatures, made sure nobody was traveling uh, recently in China. So the, uh, there, there was awareness of the pandemic, but it hadn't really reached Argentina as far as anybody knew at that time. Uh, once we got to our cabins, they had our, uh, our expedition parkas waiting for us, along with um, our boots. Um, we got to keep the parkas, we had to give them back their boots, but um, our first chance to wear our parkas was uh, a few minutes later when we had the uh, uh, mandatory uh, bend and ship drill, and we all got to figure out where our lifeboats would be in case we 
had to get off the ship. Uh, fortunately, we didn't have to do that. Um, that afternoon, as we were uh, leaving Ushuaia, uh, the expedition leader uh, gave us a briefing on what to expect in the next few days. Um, and part of that briefing was the weather forecast. Um, this slide showing the uh, predicted winds with uh, blue being uh, good and red being bad. Um, and informing us that as we left the Deagle Channel and made our way to the northeast toward the Falklands, we'd be probably mostly in, um, in green and avoid the, the worst of the winds, which was good news and news, similar news that he repeated throughout much of the trip. Robert, yeah. Robert, I'm just going to jump in on a technical issue. Um, for those of our viewers who want to see a larger frame of the slides, um, I think if you look for the view option that is side-by-side -side mode and unselect that, uh, you should be able to toggle to a view option that will just show a larger frame of the slides. Thanks. All right. So. The next day we were, was a full day at sea. Um, we had about a 400 mile crossing uh, to make to the, get to the Falkland Islands. And on our days at sea, um, they kept us uh, entertained and or educated uh, with a series of lectures. Um, I think we might've had up to four lectures uh, in any one day. It, these covered a wide variety of topics from history to geology to, you know, penguin biology, seal biology. Uh, every, you know, the, uh, the expedition crew was quite knowledgeable, um, even with, uh, you know, one of the Zodiac drivers having a PhD in, in glaciology. Uh, so we were super impressed with the, the knowledge of our expedition crew. Uh, other parts of the day was uh, spent up on the bridge, watching the, the ocean go by, but the majority of the day was spent out on the back deck uh, looking for birds. And uh, there was quite the uh, abundance of, of seabirds, um, including black-browed albatross, uh, northern giant petrels, and uh, white chin petrels. Um, so a lot of these guys are ship followers. They're, you know, fantastic flyers. And it was just a lot of fun watching them and uh, a challenge trying to photograph them. Another um, sunset on the water. And then we arrived in the Falklands. Um, we landed on two islands on the west side, West Point Island and Saunders Island. And to get to shore, we would climb down these stairs and go in a Zodiac. And then they would drop us off on shore. And at um, West Point Island, there was a bit of a walk, which was really good because we'd been on the boat for a while, a day and a half. And so it was good to get out and walk on land. And we ended up um, seeing colonies, a mixed colony of rockhopper penguins and black-browed alb albatrosses. Mixed into the rocks there. So the southern rockhopper penguin is the smallest. It's only about two feet tall, um, about five and a half pounds. In contrast, emperor penguins, which we didn't get to see, they're about four feet tall and they weigh 98 pounds. So they're huge compared to these little rock hoppers. And the rock hoppers that, that we saw were, were pretty um, sedate the day that we saw them. They just kind of sat there and didn't do a whole lot. I think that was largely because they were in mold. Right. And then we saw black-browed albatrosses. They are about have about a three foot wingspan. There are about a million of them. Um, and they're the most widespread. And so it was fun watching the parents bringing food to the chicks and the chicks grooming 
and molting and the chicks begging for food. Just these fluffy balls. And the flying skills of, of the albatrosses were, were totally amazing, the way they could just glide and glide and glide. We'd see a kelp gull here and there. Um, there were other um, scavengers coming into the colony, like uh, turkey vultures and striated caracaras. And then we got to Saunders Island, where there were gentoo penguins, our second species on the beach. They're not as colonial as the other penguins, so they're just kind of scattered all over the place on this beach here. And we, so we could walk in amongst them. They came right up to you pretty closely. And then we saw um, colonies of imperial cormorants nesting. And some more black-browed albatrosses. And then there were Magellanic penguins. So these are the ones, or I'm sorry, king penguins that stole my heart. I just love these king penguins, about three feet tall. And um, they're just really a lot of fun to watch. We'll see a lot more pictures of king penguins. So here are the Magellanic penguins, fairly small. Um, they're not in the Antarctic and they nest in burrows. And you'll see some more pictures of those later on um, where their burrows are. Upland goose, they can coexist with sheep, which makes it uh, a good place for them to be in the Falklands. And there are about 2000 of them in the Falkland Islands. And then we went over to the eastern side of the Falklands to Stanley. And this was the only town on the trip. Um, the Falklands belonged to the UK. They were involved, Stanley of course was involved in the Falkland War in 1982. And the Argentinians still call it Malvinas. They don't call this the Falklands. And so you kind of had to be careful about what you call the Falklands depending on who you were around. So this was a truly unique experience here, birding with landmines. Um, they've gone through this area and cleaned a bunch of them out from the Falklands War, but they're not sure they got them all. So we had to stay behind these signs, the suspect area out of bounds. Um, the penguins aren't heavy enough to set off the landmines. So they're fine down there, but no people past the fence. So here are more Magellanic penguins along the beach. And here's where they have their burrows in the hillsides here. Some Magellanic cormorants that were nesting on rocks. And this um, particular bird was a lot of fun to watch, the flightless Falkland steamer duck. They can fly maybe a little bit but most of the time they use their wings like paddles and they just kind of go like this to move through the water and they can go very rapidly. So it was really fun to, to see them take off across the water like that. We did see a, a familiar bird, the turkey vulture, although they don't um, migrate a whole lot. They're the same species as the ones we have here, but not the same individual birds. So we got back on the ship and had an ice cream social. Headed south, leaving Stanley. And we're accompanied by Peel's dolphins. They love chasing ships um, and followed us for a, a while here, jumping up and down. So then we had two days uh, at sea again. Uh, on our way to the South Georgia Islands. Um, this was nearly uh, 900 miles of, of open ocean. And when we got up the next day, uh, the weather had changed. Um, we had overnight, we had crossed the Antarctic Convergence. Um, this is where the relatively warm waters of the, the Southern Atlantic Ocean 
meet the cold waters of the uh, of the Southern Ocean. And the fogs had settled in and the temperatures had dropped about 15 or 20 degrees. So we, we knew something had changed. Um, we spent a lot of time on deck uh, watching for birds and again, uh, white chin petrel, but the uh, albatrosses had changed also. Um, instead of the black browns, we now had the wandering albatross. And the wandering albatross is just an amazing bird. They have the longest wingspan of, of any living bird up to 12 feet in, in length. Um, they weigh maybe 15 to 20 pounds and they're just magnificent flyers. Um, they can go thousands of miles um, without setting down. Uh, just amazing birds, really fun to watch. We spent a bunch of time out on deck uh, watching for, for wildlife. Um, and as we got near um, South Georgia, about maybe three quarters of the way there, uh, we slowed down to try to find the shag rocks uh, in, in the fog. And shag rocks are, have that name because the, the British name for cormorants is shags. And there's a large colony of uh, cormorants and or shags on the, uh, on the rocks. But when we were there, um, the call went out that whales were uh, in the area. And it wasn't long before the, the marine biologist on board identified them as blue whales. And excitement level uh, on deck went way up. Uh, yes. <laughs> we had never seen blue whales before. Uh, it definitely on our bucket list. Uh, the expedition leader had been leading uh, trips in this area for quite a while and had never seen blue whales before. The ship captain had been, you know, um, probably a captain for 20 years and had seen blue whales once before in his life. So this was quite the thrill. Uh, we learned later on that the uh, BBC was reporting um, a research that had uh, recently come out of the South Georgia area where the uh, scientists had counted 55 uh, blue whales on a 23 day survey. Um, this was the highest number of whales that had been recorded in the area in decades um, since the uh, end of whaling um, decades ago. Uh, next morning, we had arrived in the South Georgia Islands. Uh, they are a British overseas territory. There are no permanent residents um, on the islands, but there's about 100 people that um, spend their summers there, mostly government officials or researchers. Our first stop was at the Salisbury's Plain, but before we get off the ship, um, they, uh, well, I want to say that all of these sites on the uh, on the uh, South Georgia have uh, fairly detailed visitor management plans developed for them that go into uh, you know very a lot of specifics as to how many ships can come in there uh, on a daily basis, what size of ships, how many passengers can be on shore at once, uh, where they can land, where they can walk. Um, all of this is to minimize the impacts. Of, uh, of tourism on the wildlife of the island. And part of that uh, minimizing is a very thorough uh, biosecurity. Uh, so at, at all of our uh, landings, we you know, went through a foot bath and used scrub brushes on our, our boots. But here, uh, they took biosecurity to a new level, including uh, you know, working over the soles of the boots with the uh, a folded paper clip, uh, getting out every speck of sand, every seed. Um, they only went over the boots, but uh, vacuumed the, their backpacks, the insides of our coat pockets, uh, went through with a Velcro on the, all of our um, 
our coats uh, with a pair of tweezers that make sure that there is, you know, no seeds introduced. Um, South Georgia has, you know, takes biosecurity to a, a very serious level. Um, when they we got back on board, uh, they had pressure washers set up uh, the you know scrub scrub our boots down and our uh, our waterproof pants as well as a disinfectant bath to, to step through. So uh, the Salisbury Plain was um, a site with about sixty thousand king penguins. Um, here, along with elephant seals and um, and fur seals, and this was also our first opportunity to get the kayaks out. Um, so to go kayaking, we uh, got into them up out of the zodiacs, um, and then uh, the uh, the expedition crew provided the. The dry suits and the PFDs and our uh, neoprene booties and the and the gloves, um, so we were you know well protected from the the weather. Um, good quality kayaks. So this was a chance to paddle with fur seals, paddle with king penguins. We were frequently having to back paddle when either a penguin or a seal would pop up right in front of our kayak. But um, just in, enjoying the wildlife from a different view, um, the fur seal pups were quite energetic, almost flying out of the water. I think you said one of them nearly landed on your uh, on your kayak. Jumped up on the bow, and slid off. So we also had the opportunity to go, go on shore and walk among the king penguins. So we couldn't go into the heart of the colony. We had to stay on the edge, but um, it was fun to see them. The penguins would walk right up to you and check us out. And then that afternoon, we moved on to Prion Island, a um, small island off, offshore. Um, the main feature of Prion Island was a uh, wandering alb albatross colony, but they also had, you know, Gentoo penguins um, nesting there and lots of seals. There's Gentoo with its orange lipstick. But the, the wandering albatross um, has a small colony here. Um, their numbers on the Falklands have been uh, declining. The Falklands, um, I think, host about 6% of the world's population of, of wandering albatross. Um, but the IC, IUCN um, lists them as vulnerable. Uh, the primary threat being uh, that they get caught up in longline fishing. Um, so, again, they're such magnificent flyers. Other uh, birds nesting on the island for the brown skua. But to uh, get to the, uh, the nesting colony, we had a a gauntlet of fur seals. I think there's some 400,000 fur seals on the uh, South Georgia Islands. The, uh, no, there's some uh, 3 million fur seals on the South Georgia Islands. Um, the, the fur seal population was nearly extirpated in the early 1900s. Um, because of their prized fur, but their populations have rebounded considerably. The pups are 
pretty cute, but um, they can be fairly aggressive. And they have sharp teeth and lots of bacteria in the mouth. We were warned constantly not to allow them to bite our legs. They uh, also uh, a good population of elephant seals. Um, these guys have about uh, 400,000 elephant seals on the South Georgias. Um, the big bulls had already left the colonies and gone out to sea, but there were still um, females and immatures on the beach. We uh, also had the opportunity to see uh, another species of albatross, the light mantled albatross. Sometimes we didn't have to go to shore to see wildlife. Here the uh, snowy sh sheep bills uh, came to the ship and uh, roosted on our back deck on the, uh, on the hot tubs. Bob, no, one, one question that came up with your photo of the king penguins. There was one blown brown king penguin. Uh, can you describe what that was? That's coming up next, okay? <laughs> I'll answer that in the next Excellent. few pictures, okay? Sure. Because um, we saw lots more king penguins. And at Fortuna Bay, um, we started seeing king penguins right as we got off on the beach. And I am absolutely in love with king penguins. They're about three feet tall. Um, and I'm not five feet tall, so I, I guess I kind of felt some camaraderie with them. They're very deep divers. They go 150 feet to 780 feet, eat lanternfish and squid, and there's about a million of them on South Georgia Island. And this right here was a highway of penguins. We're not even looking at the main colony yet, um, but they would go back and forth along this, this um, little highway here to get to the ocean. So, you know, you're supposed to stay like five meters away, but there's no way that they would let you do that. You could stand there and they would come right up to you. But you can see glaciers in the background there. And a river that they also would take down to the ocean. Quite a few of them and you see some of the brown ones there on the right. We'll get some more close-ups in a little bit. We had trouble not taking pictures of pink penguins because they're so beautiful. And then we had some seal pups also along the way. So um, king penguins make permanent colonies since their breeding is not synchronized and their breeding cycle is greater than a year long. So um, at any time you can have both adults and chicks molting. So the brown ones are the chicks and um, most of them are, are molting, but you can also see it adults molting um, right then also. And then some of the eggs never get to be baby penguins, because squids get to them. We, we were kind of fortunate to actually see this happen here, the, the squids getting to a penguin egg. And there were lots and lots and lots of king penguins, more than I can count. You weren't even tempted to count them? No, I, I'm usually, <laughs> when we're on vacation, I'm the one that tries to count the wildlife. You know, Robert did that for a living, and so when we went on vacation, he would say, I'm not counting those, but I would be the one that would count, not with these penguins. There's no way. <laughs> yeah, they would get right up to you. And then there were also elephant seals, which are also very deep divers. They eat squid and fish. And sometimes the seal pups did not come at us. They just kind of laid there with mom. And sometimes they would come right up to us and we would have to raise our arms, make us look even bigger and 
do some, um, yeah, to get them away from us so they didn't bite us. And sometimes mom would be there. And sometimes she would scold them to tell them to stay away from us. So we moved on to strumness and leaf. Some great mountains in the background here. And these were, uh, this was an old whaling town, but you can't go in there because it's, they have not been kept up and they're um, very unsafe structures, also asbestos there. But we saw more seal pups, some of the three million on South Georgia Island. And then we saw giant petrels. At, at this point, there were a bunch of um, petrels there that were eating a penguin. And we saw the big teeth that elephant seals have. Well, that evening, we did a, a Zodiac cruise of Hercules Bay. And the, uh, the main feature of Hercules Bay was the macaroni penguin colony. Um, there's about a million pairs of macaronis on South Georgia um, out of a worldwide population of greater than 10 million. They're the most numerous penguin species of, of any of the penguin species. And it was just a lot of fun watching these guys come out of the ocean and uh, climb up the rocks. Uh, so the name macaroni um, is actually refers to the orange feathers on their head and interesting tale of i guess in the early uh, 1800s there was a, a trend for young um young men in britain to travel uh to italy and um, they would come home with elaborate hairdos and um sporting fancy fashion and these guys were referred to as macaronis. Um, and you might remember the, uh, the phrase in Yankee Doodle Dandy, stuck a feather in his cap and called it macaroni. Well, that's what the uh, name of these penguins refer to as the fancy feathers in their, on their head. Um, the next day, uh, we had moved down to Gritviken. And uh, at Gridviken, uh was their second time to get into the kayaks and um, get some exercise and explore the water uh, from a different angle. Uh, but we also got to go to shore. And uh, this uh, whaling colony was in operation from about 1904 uh, to the 1960s. Uh, at its peak, it housed up to uh, 300 men. Um, a lot of the, the sealers were from, um, from Norway. Uh, but Gritviken had been cleaned up of um, contaminants. So it was now had a museum and a, uh, a church. And you could e explore the, the old um, historic buildings. Um, we found our way up to the, uh, the cemetery because it is the site where Ernest Shackleton is buried, uh, a famous polar explorer that we heard lots about on this trip. Um, we even raised a, a glass of, uh, a little bit of whiskey to, uh, to Ernest while we were there. Um, so while it was the final resting place for, for Ernest, it was also a popular resting place for elephant seals. And the first seal pups were quite active and needed some discouragement not to harass the guests trying to get into the Zodiacs. So after lunch, we were making our way down to St. Andrews Bay. And along the way, we had our second blue whale sighting. Yes. <laughs> so this, uh, this one didn't stick around very long, but uh, we were, you know, felt very lucky to uh, have seen blue whales at, on two occasions. So that afternoon we got into St. Andrew's Bay 
um, it was a late afternoon uh, when we landed, but uh, St. Andrews has the largest king penguin colony in South Georgia, which somewhere around 150,000 pairs of king penguins. Um, here's the welcoming committee on the beach. Uh, not only the guides welcoming the guests off the zodiac, but the penguins uh, next in line for us. So the, the main colony was across a uh, glacial outwash river um, from our landing, so we couldn't uh, cross the river to get to the main colony, but uh, that didn't prevent uh, the penguins from um, coming to us as well. Um, uh, there were, there were you know, plenty on our side of the river. You see the glacier in the background. And, so a lot of these in the river were uh, molting. So with penguins, they have a, a catastrophic molt in which they, they lose all their feathers uh, in a short period of time. So in the course of uh, two or three weeks, they regrow a, a new set of feathers. And this is very uh, energetically demanding on them. So they, they can't go to sea or and feed during this time. So they, um, you know, it's very important not to disturb them uh, when they're molting. But. but there were um, several that seemed to take a particular interest in Karen and followed her around for um, a good part of 30 minutes or so referred to him as her posse. And this picture right here, if, if uh, my friend Anne is, is a part of this webinar, I think she was going to be here. She called this, uh, titled this one, Are You My Mother? I'm not sure if the yellow park is uh, make us more attractive to them or not. But. I had an absolute blast with these guys, just walking penguin speed and having them follow me. Yeah, yeah this was definitely a highlight of the trip. Also elephant seals down on the beach. So we then did a, a bit of a zodiac cruise past the, the main colony. Um, watching the penguins get in and out of the surf. There was a fair bit of active surf uh, at the site. And we're thankful for the guides that um, stood in chest deep water to hold the, the zodiacs as we got in and out of them. So to go from South Georgia islands down to the Antarctic Peninsula, there's some slight different ways that you can go, but um, there was some red on the wind charts. And so we decided, or the captain and the expedition leader decided to go slightly south and go to South Orkney Islands. And pretty soon we saw fin whales. They're very similar in shape to blue whales, not quite as big, um, only 88 feet. And their blow is about 20 feet tall, whereas the blue whales is 30, but they're still pretty spectacular creatures. And there were quite a few of them around. I think at one time you may have counted up to eight blows at once. Yeah, right. We couldn't tell exactly how many there were, but yeah, eight blows at one time. Karen, Karen, I just want to, I just, add that we're sorry you can't see the audience because the, most of us are like me, our jaws are on the floor, just really enjoying these photos. Oh, good, good. There, there are going to be more whales. You just wait. <laughs> I know. This, this was an absolutely incredible trip. Um, we had more close encounters than 
pretty much anybody ever does on, on this particular trip. So we just lucked out on that. And I, I'm also a big fan of icebergs. Having lived in the Arctic for um, eight years, I, I like ice. And so this was one of our first big um, icebergs that we saw. We saw some other smaller ones, they call them growlet, growlers, and there's some really tiny ones they call bergy bits, but we finally got into the big ones. And then one of our absolute favorite birds that we had never seen before were cape petrels. Just the patterns on, on the backs of them, and especially when you saw this many together, was, was just really amazing. We love watching the cape petrels. We spent so much time on deck. <laughs> It was great. We're glad we had warm coats. Yes, and warm mittens, and warm hats, and boots, and everything. But more icebergs. And then we stopped um, at Orcados, and this is the longest continuous running research station. It was established in Antarctica. It was established in 1904 by the UK, and then the Brits gave it to Argentina in 1905. They collect weather data, so they've gotten over 100 years of weather data from this particular base here, and then they do some other research too. Um, we were the only, only the fifth group um, to come here that season, and so it, it's not um, visited very often uh, by tourists, which was kind of cool. They, they were really excited to show us around. They seem to be particularly happy for us to visit because we offered them some, uh, you know, fresh onions and potatoes. Yes, they like that. We saw more southern elephant seals when we were out kayaking. And more fur seals that came up to the boat. And then we got a treat. Here's a leopard seal, the first one we saw, and we actually saw it we didn't, we didn't get a picture of it, but there's the elephant seal. Imagine a penguin in its mouth and it's shaking the penguin and off comes the feathers and the skin and it chomps down on the penguin. And then all these seabirds come in and eat all the little bits. So top predator, these leopard seals, pretty cool to see, especially when you're in kayaks, but just wait. And more icebergs. of all different shapes and sizes. And sometimes on the ice floes were um, some fur seals and then our first look at a daily penguins. And then there's a chin strap penguin, which we hadn't seen much before. Fur seal. And we started seeing um, southern fulmars, which are pretty much Antarctic birds. Spent some time on the bridge, and the expedition leader and the captain decided to go find A68A. And that is the biggest iceberg in the world. Um, it broke off of the Larsen Ice Shelf in 2017. It's about the size of the state of Delaware, so pretty big. And moved along. About a year after it broke off, and it started moving north. And then we came to it. And we were able to travel along A68A for about six hours. And we watched it. And then there were whales. Humpbacks here. Lots of humpbacks. They're about 50 feet long. They're pectoral fins. Um, if you've seen them before, they're about the third of the size of the whale. And then we also saw fin whales. And we saw minke whales and we saw orcas. This was just one of the most amazing days of anybody on that ship in their life. Uh, one of the guides said it was the best day of his entire life. Um, one of the people, the guides who's been an expedition leader said it was the highlight of a career. Some guides were just like, oh my gosh, wow. But whale 
after whale, after whale, after whale. So here's a humpback fluke and Robert um, made sure that pictures of flukes get sent into happywhale.com so they can keep track of, of where whales are at different times. But we asked the marine biologist and she thought that it was hundreds of whales. She was not sure about how many hundreds, but we just saw them for the entire six hours that we went along um, A68A. I think we went about um, 40 miles, maybe 40 miles, but maybe five minutes without seeing a whale, um, whale after whale after whale. So do you want to talk just a minute about, sure. about um, the glaciers? So we were really curious as to why there was such, you know, this concentration of, of biomass associated with the, the iceberg. Not only were there whales, but there were lots of seabirds. Of, uh, and um, after we got back, I got a hold of um, an oceanographer at Monterey Bay Aquarium, who had, you know, done research in this area. And uh, turns out that uh, big icebergs, you know, they're they've broken off from glaciers that were on on the mountains, and in the process, the the ice had, you know, scraped rocks and gravel and sand off the continent. And as they're melting into the ocean, they're releasing minerals that then fertilize the, the, uh, the phytoplankton, which um, then uh, feeds the zooplankton, which feeds the krill, which is food for the, the whales and the seabirds. And so the, you know, the iceberg is actually fertilizing the ocean. And the cycle continues when you have whale poop. They eat the krill, and so much of their scat is, is pink, as you can see there. And so those minerals are, um, are now back in the ocean, ready to fertilize more phytoplankton. And if you remember the other tail that we saw fairly close up, was very different than this one. So each of the humpbacks tail, their flukes, um, have a distinctive design on them, the individual whales. We loved the snow petrels. They were just gorgeous, just white with that um, black beak and eye. And then we've got some um, Cape petrels and southern pulmars. A daily penguin and more whales. And this was a humpback. Yeah, just an amazing day. And I love all the different colors in icebergs. Um, depending on how tightly the um, molecules of water are packed and, and what's in between them, you can get you know, deep blue, you can get white, um, just some amazing colors. And there's uh, pectoral fins of humpback of a humpback, so you can see how long they actually are. And then came the orca pod. So we were thrilled to start seeing these orcas, and they came pretty close to the boat. They seemed curious. They came right up and and were right near us. and more humpbacks around the orcas. A Cape petrel and an Adelie penguin. So Antarctic terns are residents, so they're not like the Arctic tern that goes from 
the Arctic to the Antarctic and back again every year. The Antarctic terns are just in the Antarctic and they stay there. And we still saw more whales. And we're getting close to the end of A68A. Sometimes there were cracks going back in and you could look back in there and, and see um, lots of little icebergs falling off. And then as we were going past one section, it calved right beside of us. And there was so much that came off that we actually could feel the wake a little while later on the boat. Very fortuitous. And then it was the sunset and we were off to the Antarctic Peninsula. So overnight we reached the peninsula and in mid morning after one of the uh, lectures, uh, the call went out that orcas were in the area and everybody you know, put on their coats and grabbed their cameras and headed out the deck. And here I think there was a pod of about four orcas and a variety of seabirds following them, um, skuas and petrels. And, uh, these guys came pretty close to the ship and did some rolls and this one had a broken off uh, dorsal fin, so he was pretty distinctive. But, uh, the big males have the longest dorsal fins. But followed by kelp gulls and other seabirds looking for any krill that they might have, um, whales might have you know, brought up to the surface. Then we started uh, motoring along the, the, the land of ice and rocks. Being rocks and all the ice on top. I think I read somewhere like, like somewhere like 70 or 80 percent of the world's fresh water is in ice on, in Antarctica. If it were to all melt it, uh, I think the sea levels would come up about 120 feet. Uh, but that afternoon in Curtis Bay, we got to go kayaking again. Uh, and this time it was a little chunkier um, that, to paddle through. But it was the, the sun was out and we were out of the wind, so it, was, it felt fairly comfortable. Uh, paddling in the ice. But um, had another beautiful sunset and the next morning we had moved down to Portal Point and beautiful sunrise. And another chance to go pat kayaking with ice. This time we had some bigger icebergs that we paddled around and uh, we gave the, the big icebergs a very wide berth. So this was our first opportunity to actually set foot on the, the continent itself um, and uh, stretch our legs for a little bit, uh, get up on some higher ground and view the scenery. And then that afternoon, we had moved down to Enterprise Island and got the kayaks out again. And started out, we ended up not paddling very far that afternoon. So we paddled just a little bit and before we knew it, the whales were coming to us. And I think there was like two different groups of humpbacks that came by for a visit. And these guys were quite curious and came up right up to our, our pod of, um, of kayaks. And I think there was a calf among this that was especially curious. 
So the calf came right up on the right side of my boat. I could, couldn't quite touch it. And then I looked off to the left side and, and its pectoral fin was sticking out on the other side of my boat. So it was half under my boat. Yeah, the, the guides told us that by regulation, we couldn't paddle within a hundred meters of the whales, but if they came to us, there was nothing we could do about it. So <laughs> we just sat there and enjoyed it. Um, I think I act, can actually describe our entire group as being giddy that afternoon. It's humbling being in the water with creatures that are bigger than your kayak by quite a bit. Three times, you say. But they were, you know, incredibly gentle and, you know, they knew we were there. They were just curious and checking us out. After we got back on ship, they had the uh, Antarctic barbecue on the back deck with lots of grilled meats and uh, cold beverages. And then the next day we went to Paradise Harbor. And um, if you remember me saying something about us being really, really lucky to have close encounters with critters again and again and again. This was minky morning. So we went out in the kayaks and this is how they got them off the boats. They put them on the Zodiac and lifted them down with a crane. And we got in the boats and all of a sudden there were minky whales around us. They're about 30 feet long. So quite a bit smaller than some of the other ones that we had seen, but very fast swimmers. Um, we actually tried to outrace them but there was no way. <laughs> they were took went around us and came up in front of us, and so that was fun. So then we just kind of stayed there, and they came up and turned over and spy hopped and went under, and one time even slightly lift lifted one kayak up. But we just watched the Mickey whales. We didn't go too far because it was just fun watching them. They came really close and we weren't scared. At least I wasn't and Robert wasn't either. But as Robert said, it's very humbling to be among these creatures, even though they were only 30 feet long, that's still quite a bit longer than any of us. And we were very happy to, to get a bit of hot chocolate at the end of, of that paddle, um, raising our glasses and warming up just a bit. Although we get pretty warm with the gear that we had. So there are about 200,000 minkies in Antarctica. And um, this is one of them in front of an iceberg. And then Fournier Bay. We, um, the expedition leader decided to go in there because there were there are going to be really strong winds along the Gerlach Strait, which is the area that we had been traveling in, um, 30 knots with gusts to 50. So we we're trying to find a sheltered place. And we got in there and it was snowing. But we went paddling anyway. And all around us were humpbacks. A lot of the time we couldn't even see them because it was snowing so hard. And again, we did not approach them. We just stayed there and they came um, up to us pretty darn close. And this time it was so amazing because with um, the snow, I'm not sure how, how that worked with, with the sounds, but we heard grunts and we heard blows and we heard snorts and we heard groans. It was just amazing to, to listen to them and then have them right there with us again. And when I asked the, the kayak guide, so this kind of thing happens with every group, right? And she said, no, never. <laughs> So we just were really, really lucky. And we thought that the, the whales had taken off a little ways as we were coming back to shore. And we decided to have a snowball fight and we're throwing snowballs back and forth. And then all of a sudden, 
up comes a whale right in the middle of a snowball fight and we managed to miss it, which was really lucky. I wouldn't want to hit a whale with a snowball. I don't know that it would have cared. But... It probably wouldn't have, but it would have made me feel bad. So the next morning, um, we had moved to Danko Island and um, we had a decision to make. You know, the kayaks were going out, but Danko Island was going to be our last um, penguin colony of the trip, and I, I didn't quite have my fill of penguins yet, um, and Karen really wanted to go kayaking, so we... It was a hard decision, yeah. I tell you. <laughs> penguins are kayaking. Uh, we decided to split up that morning, so I, I went for penguins and Karen went kayaking. Uh, so here, the, it was a Gen 2 penguin colony. There was about 1,600 uh, breeding pairs of Gen 2 on the island. Um, Gentoos are the, the third largest penguin. Um, their colonies are located on ice-free areas and they make nests um, up from the stones. Um, Gentoos are listed by IUCN as a least concerned species. They have a worldwide population of about three quarters of a million, although some areas are seeing uh, some population declines. But um, it was, you know, snowing uh, that morning and the penguins seemed to enjoy the snow. Um, some of the young ones seemed to be trying to catch the snowflakes in their beaks. That one might be trying to catch a snowflake. But um, the young penguins are just incredibly cute. Young ones just hanging out, waiting for mom and dad to bring them back some, some partially digested krill. But the scenery around the colony was amazing. And Then I spotted Karen down on the beach and thought, but weren't you out kayaking? Well, we got the boats in back of the Zodiac and we were going to get in the boats, but a leopard seal comes up. And this leopard seal seemed to be pretty playful, at least at the beginning. It would bang on one side of the boat and it would go, they would move to one side the seal would go under the boats and it would bang them and they would move to the other side. So it was just playing bumper boats back and forth. But then it started to try and climb into the cockpits and then it would swim over and take just a slight break on an ice floe close by. And then it would come up right by the Zodiac. This is not with telephoto lens or anything. I just had my hand there not long before. Um, and remember that um, leopard seals are top predators. And then it tried to bite the boats. And at that point we decided, eh, we're not definitely not going kayaking and we better take off to try and not habituate this, this seal to humans. And so we took off and she tried to follow for a while, but we lost her. And um, then we were gonna get in the kayaks and up pops a male orcas um, fin and we decided to watch the male orca instead of getting into the kayak. So we never kayaked that day, but we had the two top predators right near us. So that was pretty darn cool. So that afternoon we uh, moved over to um, Chiriguano Bay and this was our last kayaking opportunity on the trip. Um, it was just a, the weather had, had cleared, um, the sun was out, it was a nice day for, nice afternoon for a paddle. Um, the wildlife was, you know, better behaved here. The, uh, most of the seals we saw were Waddell seals that were just hanging out on the ice floes. So, nice paddle for the afternoon. We did spot one leopard seal on an ice floe that was 
you know, sleeping, but we gave it a wide berth and um, headed back to sea. And then um, it was time to leave the Antarctic Peninsula and head across the Drake Passage back to Ushuaia. Um, we had a couple days at sea. Um, watching for seabirds, Cape Petrels again. We got closer to South America, the uh, Imperial Cormorant came out, as did the Southern Giant Petrels. By afternoon of day two, we were within sight of Cape Horn uh, got permission to come in a little bit closer than um, we might have otherwise. And then it was time to raise a glass and uh, toast our captain. Uh, captain Yuri was Russian, uh, did an excellent job of captaining our ship and our expedition leader, Solon, who together uh, managed to you know, put together a fantastic trip. Um, say goodbye to all of our guides. That we were just thoroughly impressed with their professionalism, their knowledge, uh, their skills, uh, their willingness to share their enthusiasm for the area with us. And woke up the next morning and we were uh, starting to dock in Ushuaia. It was time to say goodbye to the ocean adventurer and Goodbye to all of our new friends that we met on the trip. So with that, we'd be happy to take any questions. Karen and Robert, Karen and Robert I, I, want I want to thank you so, so much. much. Oh boy, okay, now there's an echo on my on end. Well, uh, Fred had a terrible echo, echo and now I do. Here. Really apologize. Um, is that any better? Okay, I'm gonna see if I can um, ask questions without the echo. Um, Robert and Karen, can you guys hear me? You're, you're muted right now. You can hear me, okay, good, and I'm not echoing. Okay, let's look at some of the questions then. Um, first of all, I just wanna say this has been amazing. And I think if we were all together, in the same room, you would hear a lot of us gasp and cheer, and um, I, I was just uh, just blown away. Thank you so much for sharing your trip of a lifetime with us, and we've gotten a lot of comments from people, too, about how wonderful this is and it, how fun it's been to listen to your narration of your wonderful trip. We've got a few questions to ask you, though, and yeah, I'm going to start off with um, a question about the seals. And the question is, do the female seals show aggression or just the pups? With the first seals, it was just the pups. And I don't, I don't really understand the behavior, but you know, the, the females were, eh, tourists. You know, and sometimes they would like scold the, the pups to, you know, they, you know, tell the pups to get away from the tourists. And they would sometimes <laughs> even kind of herd them away from us. But yeah, I, I don't know what, what the, the pups were trying to um, pretend to be big and learn how to attack. I don't know, but it was just the pups. And they were pretty intimidated when you went like that, even as short as I am. So here's a good question. How cold was it? Hmm. Um, so air temperatures and water temperatures in Antarctica was right around freezing. So not that different from Wisconsin when we left here in you know, mid-February. The only difference was that um, you could have a, a fair bit of wind, which especially like on the ship's bow and in the zodiacs when you're on a, a moving uh, vessel, uh, the wind could be a bit biting. 
And the Falklands in South Georgia were warmer than that, um, 40 and maybe even 50s in the Falklands. Hey, thank you. Here's another question. Tell us what it sounded like. What were some of the sounds that you heard? Uh, it's so hard to, um, you know, capture the sounds. I did do a little bit of video work. Um, I got some, some of the video up on uh, my YouTube channel um, that does a better job than trying to describe it, but the, the penguin colonies were quite no noisy. Um, and each penguin has a different call, too. And then, you know, the, I, I remember ice as, as we're paddling along, banging against our kayaks and ice calving off of glaciers. And the one iceberg that after we had paddled around it, you hear this big boom and it turns. And then that day with the humpbacks where they were making all kinds of noises that I didn't realize that humpbacks make. I mean, you hear the blows and you hear about all of their um, songs underneath the water, but the groans and the grunts and those kinds of things we had not um, Yeah, I think really some about. of that was captured in some of the video that yeah. we got, but um, we didn't think we could really do video over Zoom very effectively. We tried and it was just jerky. Maybe we can put a link um, to your video um, in our in our website article about this because we're recording this this uh, Zoom session too, and so we'll have it up on our website. That'd be good. So here's the more specific question about the sounds. What did the penguin sound like? Some of them would make you know kind of from low to high. <laughs> um, I'm not a real good at, at mimicking, mimicking them, but th there were some that in a way reminded me of, of Crane Unison, of Sandhills Unison calls. Not exactly like that, but they would go back and forth in that manner. Do you remember other? Yeah, it's be hard to describe. Yeah, they are hard to describe. Yeah. But pretty cool to listen to them. We have a lot of questions about penguin sounds. Here's another one. Do penguins have more than one call per species like loons? Yes. Um, I remember different ones, especially with the king penguins. And, but I'm not sure exactly what, what they're for and what each one means. Yeah. Hey, thank you. Is there evidence of international cooperation in Antarctica? Very much so. So the uh, not sure how many different countries are involved in the Antarctic Treaty, uh, but there's an international treaty that um, specifies the, you know, it doesn't recognize any of the land claims. A lot of the land claims are overlapping. Uh, so it basically says we're going to just put all those land claims, you know, uh, on hold for now. And, um, you know, the only uses for Antarctica is basically research. Uh, there's, uh, right now there's, um, it's against the treaties for any sort of mineral ex ex exploitation. Um, as the, more and more of the continent becomes available with uh, global warming, um, there's likely to be competition for mineral resources. But for now, um, there's quite a bit of cooperation. Uh, Great, thank you. We have a comment that you have had that shown us some great photography. Can you give us some details of your camera and recommended lenses? Robert, I have a point and shoot. Um, so I was using a, a, a Canon digital single lens reflex. Um, and I met, a lot of my wildlife shots were taken with a, uh, a 100 to 400 zoom. Um, some of the landscape ones might have been a, a, using a 24 to 70 uh, lens as well. That's my, my standard. Uh, and then we both had uh, waterproof point and shoots that we 
you know, had in our uh, PFDs. Um, and a few of the uh, a few of the pictures of us in our kayaks were taken by the uh, the expedition photographer was um, one of the Zodiac drivers, and she was with us during the uh, the humpback afternoon. Uh, so some of the shots were borrowed from her. Thank you. Did your guides mention any changes attributed to climate change? Could that be why so many whales were around? Um, yeah, there was quite a bit of discussion of climate change. They try not to um, make the whole trip about that, but they sort of, you know, led up to a, a climate change lecture toward the end of the trip. Um, and, you know, climate change is definitely contributing to the breakup of some of the large ice shelves. So, um, and, the, you know, the creation of these, you know, massive glaciers or massive icebergs. Um, and, you know, eventually a lot of these ice shelves are going to uh, disappear. Um, and that's going to have impacts on, you know, uh, some of the other penguin species that depend on uh, the ice shelves for uh, nesting sites, like the, uh, yeah, the emperors and the, right, right. the Adelis. Thank you. Well, Karen, this is for you. What were you doing in Antarctica for eight seasons? Oh, I was in the Arctic, um, Northwest Alaska. That was my first teaching job. Um, Columbus, Ohio, I thought was flat and boring and I wanted adventure. So I went to live in a couple of little Inupiaq villages and teach science and math and anything else that, went, that they wanted me to teach up there. So, Thanks, Karen. I, I, mi I misread that. <laughs> I misread the question. <laughs> Thank okay. you. And here's another about the penguins. The penguin species that had an asynchronous breeding season, when did that season begin and end? They couldn't have made it during the winter, certainly. Um, are we picking up an echo now? Yeah, that's how we're getting an echo. No. Keep going. Didn't. So they generally start the breeding season and um, I guess in spring, which down there would be October, November, but they have like a 14 month season. So um, part of the um, and they're not entirely synchronized, so they don't all start at the same time. But uh, you know, a lot of the eggs are laid um, in spring, October, November. Uh, but there were still um, still adults incubating um, we were when we were there. Yeah. Because on Georgia Island, it doesn't get as cold as it does in Antarctica. It's cold, but not as cold. We're, we're really interested in the penguins, because here's another question. Are the different penguin species competitive with one another? And is there such a thing as intermixed colonies? Um, we didn't actually see any intermixed colonies, but the when we were on uh, Saunders Island, there were you know, four different species species of penguins um, at the one site. Um, you know, the gentoos were on the beach and there was a small group of kings that were nearby, but they were kind of isolated by themselves. Um, and then the rock hoppers were on different habitat, more on the cliff side, and the, uh, the uh, Magellan. Magellanics were up uh, on a hillside, so they each have sort of different uh, different habitat requirements, uh, so they don't really compete with each other uh, for uh, ne nesting colonies. They may compete some um, for food resources. Krill, especially. Thank you. I think we'll take one more question, then we'll wrap up. Um, 
We're curious as to what degree any of the wildlife are habituated to people. Mm. They were very tolerant of people. Um, you know, the penguins don't, don't have a land-based predator. So, um, you know, they don't seem to have any fear for um, yeah. mammalian mammals walking around on land. Uh, their only predators are seals and, and orcas. In the ocean. Uh, in the oh, ocean, yeah. so. so. Yeah, so uh, they didn't evolve with, with um, you know, predators on land, and so they didn't develop that, that fear. So they seem to be pretty tolerant. Um, kind of like if, if you've gone to the Galapagos too, they, they're, you don't try and get close to them, but, but they don't move away from you like they, like a wild animal would here. Um, the company we went was pretty good about trying to keep us away if the animals would leave us alone, but lots of times they wouldn't. They would come right up to you, even if you just stood there. I think we'll wrap up our questions now. Thank you again so much for sharing this wonderful journey with us. Um, thank you, Robert and Karen, for um, not just sharing the journey, but for all of your inspiring careers with conservation um, that continue today. Thanks for everything you've done for us <clears throat> in Wisconsin with your, your illustrious careers. We want to remind everyone that our conservation webinar series continues over the next two weeks. Um, our, our next one will be on April 23rd. Uh, coming down the pipeline, we'll be talking about oil, oil pipelines in Wisconsin uh, with Rob Lee from Midwest Environmental Advocates, myself and Tom Giroux from Wisconsin's Green Fire. So if you're interested in this topic, please register for it. We still have spaces. And then on April 30th, our program will be um, our Living Ancestors with John Bates. And this should be so interesting. You know, John Bates was on um, public broadcasting, Brief But Spectacular, a couple months ago, and we've shared that on our website. So this should be a wonderful opportunity for us to hear from John and to have some uh, Q&A time back with John as well. We'd love to hear from you about this event. So you'll be getting a, an email from us uh, it'll actually come from Zoom. Uh, and we'll be asking for your suggestions on future programs and your feedback on this particular program. And we've been recording this, so you'll be able to see this webinar again and tell your friends if they weren't able to join us this evening, that it, it will be on our website within a couple of days. On behalf of Wisconsin's Green Fire, we'd like to thank you all for joining us for your participation on this evening. And thank you all, be safe and be well. Thanks everyone, take care, all the best.